Hello guys, this is module five. We're gonna be talking about uh, liability, school personnel liability. Probably one of the scariest things the school administrator is potential liability of you and your staff. Um, I would make sure as a school principal that I had liability insurance. Um, in fact, usually I carried liability insurance up to a million dollars. Um, to protect myself from these claims because like all all claims they don't have to be founded in fact for someone to uh, file a liability or negligence charge against you but uh, here's just a little bit about liability that I wanted to uh, share with you guys today Okay, so here we are, it's module five. Um, we'll be talking about liability uh, in your book, it's chapter six and seven. So uh, make sure that you read those. First of all, there's this, this um, understanding by the court that schools are gonna be a safe place. In fact, your book talks about it this way. It says, prudent professional educators acting in the place of the parents, which is in loco parentis, are supervising students under their care and ensuring to the greatest extent possible that they are safe. And that's true. So schools is a safe place. Here are the three legal duties according to this concept of in loco parentis. To instruct, to supervise, which carries with it its own expectations, and then to provide for student safety. Those are the three things that all educators are supposed to do according to the court. So let's talk about these different uh, claims of injury that could happen. First, the book talks about intentional torts, uh, things like assault and battery, defamation, slander and libel, where you're talking about, um, you know, we're using words to harm somebody's character, false imprisonment, are you, is, the, is the student being held uh, without you know, and being injured while they're being held without any reasons, trespassing. Uh, and those are all talked about in your book. You can look at those, but really the ones I want to talk to you about are these things that we call unintentional torts. And the court deals with it with school personnel in, um, in the realm of negligence. Um, and, and they define negligence as, as um, not doing what a prudent person would do in that situation. So there's four elements. I want to talk to you a little bit about these four elements of negligence that are, uh, that are in the courts. First of all, is this idea of the standard of care. And this idea requires that school people exercise the same degree of care that other professional educators holding similar positions would exercise under the same or similar conditions. And the standard of care is determined by the age and maturity level of the students. So there's a higher standard of care for the younger students than there is for the older students. And nonetheless, there's still this idea of standard of care that, that we as educators owe a duty to protect students. Uh, according to these certain standards. And so it's a, it's a requirement um, that, again, we saw that in loco parentis, part of what we're supposed to do is supervise. So there is a, a standard of care that we're expected to have. The second element of negligence is a breach of duty. And this is, really it deals with foreseeability. So if the teacher or educator is providing a standard of care and they foresee or should reasonably be able to foresee that there's possibility of an injury occurring to a student, then they would be guilty of a breach of duty. So their duty is to provide that supervision. They, a reasonable person should be able to see that there is a issue, uh, possible harm and the educator breached that duty. The third element is proximity or legal cause. Um, there has to be evidence that the failure of the teacher um, to provide that standard of care 
directly related to the injury that occurred. Uh, so there has to be, they have to be able to have prevented whatever it is that occurred. And then the fourth thing is injury. You know, the, the student um, would have to suffer some harm in some way, form or fashion. So those are the four elements of negligence. And so you need to, I don't know if you want to use these legal terms, but you certainly need to discuss those with your staff. Uh, need to understand that these are the legal standards for negligence. Here are some concerns I would have if, uh, as a school principal. First and foremost, and mostly is classroom or school supervision. And, uh, you know, I always worry about when a teacher has to leave a classroom uh, full of students to go take care of some kind of personal business, to go to the bathroom, to make a phone call, uh, whatever, and they leave those students in there by themselves, then they really are opening themselves up to negligence uh, and, and, you know, really opening themselves up to having these claims um, made against them. And so talked a lot with teachers about, um, you know, making sure that they stay in their classroom. If they have to leave, they have somebody step in and provide that supervision. What about hallways? What about student bathrooms? I mean, all those kinds of things that uh, would be areas of concern. And not only during the school hours, but before and after school and at co-curricular and extracurricular activities and for field trips. Your book talks all about those. One of the areas this, the last 10 years that have really uh, come, been litigated is this idea of bullying. Uh, student to student bullying, uh, teacher to student bullying, that's, you know, it's just what is the, the liability of the school and the teachers uh, to prevent these kinds of things. Of course, social media just brings up a whole lot of issues as it relates to liability. How much should the school and the educators uh, be expected to prevent social media issues taking place between students? And then sexual misconduct is the one that, uh, you know, is probably the most harmful. Um, any kind of sexual misconduct between students or, or adults and students. And then the one your book talks about that really I felt like was uh, potentially real interesting is this whole idea of educational malpractice, um, academically injuring students by not providing them the proper academic instruction. Uh, and that's going to be litigated and has is starting to be litigated even as we speak. So the defenses for negligence. Um, your book talks about these. I'm not going to go into great detail. There's a couple I do want to point out, though. Your book talks about contributory contributory negligence. That's where the the student who's been injured has some responsibility. Uh, that the student also assumes some risk. Uh, the book talked about a, a student who knowingly put together chemicals that ended up burning them, and they should have known or did know that those were dangerous and so they assumed some of that risk. Comparative negligence is, is uh, really a relatively recent term and, and it really is determines levels of negligence. Uh, so there's some comparative levels of negligence. It may be that you aren't completely negligent but you should have provided some level of supervision so they will uh, provide um, a comparative um, awards. This idea of deliberate indifference, um, and the court uses this idea of deliberate indifference, and I talk to educators a lot about um, the definition of deliberate indifference is uh, knowing about a potential harm taking place with a student and, and deliberately not doing anything about it. And this is a legal standard that's been defined in law. Um, it's not a very high standard, unfortunately, but it is a legal standard. Um, so basically, the whole idea is if an educator knows about a potential harm, then it is incumbent upon the educator to do something about it, to report it to someone or to uh, prevent it or to step in. So this idea of deliberate indi indifference um, can keep some educators from these charges of negligence. 
and then um, school people because of the fact that their governments are fall because of the fact that they have this high standard of in local parentis enjoy qualified immunity in a lot of ways and so there's just certain torts that they can't be charged with uh, each state probably is different so you'll need to check on the actual language in your state law but uh, all educators enjoy a certain level of qualified immunity from some charges. So then the next chapter talks a lot about educational records. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this. You do need to be aware of and know FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, talks about uh, two specific things when it comes to FERPA, confidentiality. That means student records are confidential. They're not to be shared with other people. Uh, you can't give away information this educational as it contained in these educational uh, records and then just a idea of fundamental fairness and then it talks about the rights of parents non-custodial parents the rights of students especially when they turn 18 years of age they have all the rights that their parents would have had and then rights of school personnel to review student records so um, you know uh, and student records could be anything from um, their, their grades, a note from a teacher that's found its way into a student record. Uh, they have birth certificates, they have shot records, a lot of things that are found in those student records. Those are all confidential. The parents can look at them. Some non-custodial parents can look at them based off of whatever the, the legal agreement is. Students, when they reach the age of 18, can review them. And then school personnel, as long as they have an educational reason, can review educational records as well. And then the last thing is uh, the recently or relatively recently in the legal terms, um, there was a challenge that students couldn't grade each other's papers because that was a violation of FERPA. But in Owasso ISD versus Falvo in 2002, the Supreme Court said peer grading does not violate FERPA. So that's, that's always a, a way that teachers use to help expedite grading of papers. Uh, remember that you have your, um, remember that you have your assignment, the playground supervision rules. Um, hopefully you'll get a chance to, to write those up as they relate to negligence and those four, four uh, responsibilities we talk about duty of care and, and um, uh, breach of duty and injury. Anyway, those four things. So just keep those in mind as you write those up. If you have any questions, please email me. And I look forward to, to um, talking to you guys this way next week.